I've got to stop. I would like to pretend that, that I want to pray right now, but I actually started the song in the wrong key. <laughs> so, so, we'll scrub that from the tape and let's keep this between us. There's nothing worth more than could ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone for your presence Lord and oh Holy Spirit you are welcome here well, come place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence.
Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Amen. Thank you, band. Thank you always. And thank you to... Uh, Mitchell Hastings, our guest worship leader for the past couple of weeks while Andrew is out of town. Thank you very much. And uh, for what it's worth, I like that key better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was going to be impressive. Uh, Folks, we are in the middle of a uh, sermon series, actually wrapping one up today. Uh, we've been talking about laws of the woods. I'll share a little bit more about that in just a second. Uh, but for those of you who have uh, walked in and wondered what has happened, yes, Vacation Bible School took over. We did have a, a hammock and a tent and a campfire and a, and a, um, a uh, lantern up here for the past few weeks. It all moved out and we, uh, we've got big clouds, big, big letters, big flowers. It's been a, a wonderful week, so again, I know we've said it many times over, but thank you again to everybody that made that possible. All right, I'll be reading to you from Matthew, from the seventh chapter, and uh, picking up with just verse 13 and 14, two verses today. Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction, and there are many who take it, for the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life and there are few who find it. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this sermon series is called Laws of the Woods. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, the idea behind the title of the sermon series it comes from the family camping trips that we used to take when I was a kid. It used to be my uncle and my cousin, my father and I, and we would go every year on, on a week-long camping trip we would go up to the uh, Minnesota-Canada border called the Boundary Waters uh, Canoe Area, and up there it was very primitive camping, you know, the kind where you carry everything in with you, there's no electricity, you don't even see airplanes flying overhead, no cell phone towers in sight, that kind of a thing. So it is, it is on purpose that you go out and you try to be as remote as possible because there's something either uh, wonderful or crazy about doing something like that, depending on your perspective on, on camping and, and being in environments like that. And we would notice as we camped as a group every year that there were certain things that always seemed to take place. And we started dubbing these things the laws of the woods. Like, for example, uh, two weeks ago I talked about how no matter where you sit around the campfire, the smoke is always going to find you. And you can shift, but it's going to find you again. And it's going to get in your clothes, it's going to sting your eyes, and you're going to have to walk away and just come back and know that that is just a part of the deal. And we talked about how much like Jesus talks about pray without hesitation and, and pray uh, persistently, the smoke was persistent in always finding us around the fire. We talked about the importance of sacrifice in our own lives and uh, Sometimes, like when you're camping, you gotta just go ahead and get your boots wet in order to save the canoe from tipping over when you're trying to drag it up onto the shore and, and beach it. Last week, we talked about how everything tastes a little bit better when dirt is in it. We talked about getting our hands dirty and, and, and reconnecting with some of the things in, in life that, that make a difference, like getting our hands down in the dirt. And today's law of the woods is this. It's always worth it to take two trips. Two trips are important. And that goes back to what we learned about portaging. Now, portaging is the idea that as you move from one lake to the next within the wilderness, you have to take all of your gear, including your canoe, and put it up on your shoulders and carry it through a, a small trail through the woods called a portage. And the portages are, are usually not much wider than this, sometimes even a little bit smaller. And you're going to have to step through mud and walk over the uh, top of rocks. Sometimes you'll have to get over a fallen tree if there's been a storm, that kind of thing. Portages are measured in rods. And a rod, uh, very sort of unscientifically, is probably from maybe here to the back of the room, maybe a little bit longer than that. So you'll look at your map and it'll, it'll show a portage and it'll say five next to it, five rods. So five lengths of this room is what you would have to do doesn't tell you whether it's uphill or downhill or flooded or things in the way, but you do it. Well, the thing about portaging is that sometimes they can be much, much longer than that. 
several hundred rods even, and a portage could take you anywhere from 45 seconds to a couple hours, depending on how long it is. One of the things that you're tempted to do when you're portaging is, especially on the long ones, to try to take everything that you brought and do it in one trip. I mean, think about it, it's much more efficient, first of all. You wanna get it all there. Uh, you're trying to make good time. You're fighting, sometimes if you're trying to cover a lot of ground, you're fighting daylight. You've got a destination in mind, you've got to get there, you've got to set up camp, and you've got to get dinner ready before the sun goes down, otherwise it gets much more difficult. The idea that you're going to want to do that, finish the portage, be all hot and sweaty, and then turn around and walk it again empty-handed, just so you can walk it again, carrying gear, it's not terribly enticing. And yet, what we found was, it's always worth it to make two trips. Why? Because the fact of the matter is, it's like so many other things that we do that involve shortcuts in our lives, it will be one of those things where it, it, will, it will probably take twice as long as it needs to. You're weighed down with all the gear, you move a lot slower. You start slowing down and guess what? Mosquitoes start to land on you. You walk a little slower and it's easier when you're carrying all that gear to roll an ankle. It's easier when you're doing that, uh, taking that trip and trying to do it all at once to start dropping things. And you are carrying things like life jackets and fishing poles and canoe paddles and other things that don't fit easily into your pack and so you begin to drop those things. Or your fishing line gets hooked on a tree and you end up dragging your line for a couple hundred yards without realizing it before your pole snags. You know, those kinds of things. And after a while you realize that it's always tempting to do it in one trip. But it's always worth it to do it in two. Now I would like to tell you that I learned this law of the woods and heeded its advice, but I am over lifetime of actually taking two trips. The temptation is so great to make it in one that I've always done it and always regretted it. But that's the temptation that we face. And so I thought about that when I was thinking about life in general and faith in general. Now Jesus talks about, in this passage from Matthew, he talks about the, 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 the broad road or the big gate and then the, the narrow gate or the narrow way. And he says, look, lots of people are gonna try to go for the big and easy way, but let me tell you, as my followers, you're gonna need to take the way that leads to life, the narrow way. Now the passage that I just read to you is from the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version. There's lots of reasons why I prefer this version and we read from it each Sunday in worship. And we're gonna do another sermon series a few months from now where we're gonna talk about some of those kinds of things in the Bible, like which translation we read from and why that might make a difference and why the Bible came to be and who put it together and some of those kinds of things, and we'll get to that later on. But there are some valuable reasons to read from other translations too. For one, you get different perspectives and sometimes a different translation will, will kind of tune your mind into something that you may not have seen having just read one version of it. So the NRSV, it may be pretty close, or at least we think close to what ancient manuscripts said and maybe therefore what Jesus said. But then there's modern day translations which are also maybe just show us a little bit something different in the text. So many years ago, a guy named Eugene Peterson, who you may have read his stuff, uh, he died a couple of years ago. Uh, but Eugene Peterson is maybe most famous for having uh, written this paraphrase of the Bible called The Message. And it's a paraphrase, meaning that it's not meant to be a word-for-word -word translation of ancient Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic or whatever. It's not meant to be that. It's meant to be just how we would say it in our own time, in our own common vernacular. And so I want to look at this passage again from Eugene Peterson's paraphrase, and I want you to show you when Jesus talks about the narrow way or the narrow gate, or in one of the other gospels, you know, the, the, the narrow gate that enters into the city or that leaves the city, as it were. Look at, listen to how this is a little bit different. All right, here's from the message from Matthew 13 to 14. Don't look for shortcuts to God. The market is flooded with surefire, easygoing formulas for a successful life that can be practiced in your spare time. Don't fall for that stuff. Even though crowds of people do, the way to life, to God, is vigorous and requires total attention. 
Now, I love Jesus' words, but there's something about this one that starts out with, don't look for shortcuts, that really captures your attention. I mean, let's, let's get to the point, right? Shortcuts are dangerous. Taking all of your gear on the portage on the first go is not going to pay off in the end. And we've all learned from shortcut problems in the past. I was thinking about shortcuts that I've taken in my life that have been disastrous. Unfortunately, the, li the list is probably rather long. Uh, one came to mind, though. When I was in seminary, Ellen and I, in our first year of marriage, we were living in, a, um, in an apartment building. It was one of those brick apartment buildings shaped kind of like a horseshoe, like there are tens of thousands of in Chicago. And uh, because it was Chicago, there was some suspicious activity that was taking place in terms of the zoning and the building regulations. And so the rule was that if a building was over three stories high, you had to put an elevator in that building. But somebody got around that by building four-story buildings and saying, no, the first floor is garden apartments. The second floor is really the first floor then. So we lived on the fourth floor, AKA, of a third, of a three-story building. Fourth floor of a three-story building. Because the garden apartment's level one, two, three, and we were up on three. So it was no big deal. We were in our 20s, we could leap up the stairs, no sweat. At the end of the day, we'd bring home our backpacks and whatever, we'd carry our bags, we'd go up the stairs. The problem was on grocery day. And I'm not somebody that likes to go to the grocery store. So when, and neither is Eleanor, so when we would go to the grocery store, it'd be that once a week or once every week and a half trip and you'd buy tons of stuff. And I'm one of those people that still to this day, I like to load my arms up all the way to the elbows with grocery bags and take one trip into the house. Now it's not so big of a deal living at the parsonage because there's just a half a flight of stairs and boom, you're upstairs and into the kitchen. Fourth floor walk up, that was a different deal. So one day I'm sitting at my desk lamenting the fact that it's grocery day and I'm looking out my window, and I noticed that on the outside of this building, which was about a 100-year-old building, there was this steel bar that came out at a 90-degree angle, and it was about as long as my arm. And I got to thinking, how could I use this to my advantage? I don't know what it was there for. I don't know if somebody hung a potted plant out there or if a thermometer was out there or something, but I decided that I was going to make a quick trip to the hardware store, going to get some rope and a pulley and a carabiner. And I rigged up this little system so that when I got home from the grocery store the next time, I probably put, I don't know, 12 bags or so on this carabiner. I hooked it up, got up to the top, opened up the window, reached out, grabbed the line, and I thought I was slick, right? It only took until it started crashing against my second floor neighbor's window that I realized that I had rubbed one of these bags so bare that the content started falling out, smearing her window on the way down, crashing on the sidewalk below, making a grand mess. I got it to the top, found that all 12 eggs were broken, the milk carton had sprung a leak, and all my fruit was bruised for the next week. And then I spent, in an effort to have to make just one trip of dragging that pulley up, I ended up spending multiple trips going down and cleaning up the mess below. Shortcuts. Sometimes they work. Often they don't. And Jesus certainly warns against this. You know, when we read this first passage from Matthew and Jesus is talking about the narrow way or the, or the, and the way that leads to life or, or this broad way that, that everybody is so tempted to take, it's almost easy for us to look at that and say, oh, well, he's talking about Christians and then everybody else. Like everybody else are the people that are out there taking the shortcuts and we're the ones living on the straight and narrow and, and doing the righteous thing. But if you examine this text in the context of what Jesus is saying, he's not talking about all of everybody else. He's talking about the followers that he has amassed so far. This is part of the Sermon on the Mount. He's talking to just a handful of disciples and anybody else who is there on the mountainside in that natural amphitheater. And Jesus is talking to them and he's saying basically this, among you as believers, there will be some who look for shortcuts and there will be some who do the hard thing and the right thing. And the hard thing and the right thing will lead to life and the shortcuts will be where the majority of people go because they want the quick and the easy way. So we know that Jesus is saying this isn't just a problem of, of people who are, are not believers. This is a problem among all of us. All of us are going to look for shortcuts. 
All of us are going to be tempted. All of us are going to have these issues. This is going to be a recurring concern for every one of us. So what do those look like? Those of you who read the, the book that we did during Lent on the Sermon on the Mount may remember that the author, A.J. Levine, said, this is an example of, of, of saying, for example, it's much harder to love your enemies than to hate them. It's much easier to sue somebody than to reconcile with them. It's much easier to be judgmental instead of humble. And so she gives these kind of practical examples of, okay, so here's what it looks like really in life when you're doing this. And she says, if we want as a guide for ourselves, as Jesus followers, of what it means to look for ways to stay on that narrow path or to look for that narrow gate, she says we must first filter this through the commandment to love one another. You may remember that Jesus' parting words to his disciples and the last night he spent with them, he said, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. That new mandate, that's where we get mandatum, it's a Latin word for mandate, which is where we get the word for Maundy Thursday, the mandate Thursday. This new mandate that you love one another. So she says, that if we are trying to figure out where it is, that where the broad path is or where the narrow path is, you have to be able to filter through this, this commandment to love one another. Are you taking the proper response? Well, I don't know. Is this showing love to your neighbor? Is this showing love to God? Is this showing love to yourself? And most of the time, I think that that's a pretty good filter for trying to figure out what is on the broad path that leads to destruction or what is on the narrow path that leads to life. Jesus walks up on a woman who is about to be stoned and he steps in between those who have rocks in their hands and the woman and what she's accused of and he says, let those without sin cast the first stone. And it makes the men think and they drop their stones by their side. They had every right to do that. They probably saw that action as just. They rationalized what they were doing. But through the filter of love, was that the right response? It's much easier to say, no, a wrong was caused, kill her and let's move on, than to say, we need to bring this person back into the fold of the community. Welcome them back. Help them again to walk on the straight and narrow. There are other examples like this in scripture too. Jesus is always standing there and he oftentimes is saying something that is contrary to popular opinion or certainly contrary to the shortcuts that people are tempted to take. And he stands in the middle and he says, no, no, and he shows us what living through the example of love looks like. When I was thinking about those portages, those dreaded long portages that I didn't like taking as a kid. I realized how ironic that was. I mean, consider this for a second. Why does one choose to lock their wallets and their phone in their car glove compartment, get into a boat and paddle off into the wilderness for a week? Why does one do that? Probably because you are seeking to be in nature. Maybe to have an encounter with God in nature. Maybe to get reconnected with the people that you are traveling with, but certainly to be in the middle of God's creation. How weird is it that all I wanted to do was burn through that experience as quickly as possible, when in fact by setting down the stuff and going back and taking the walk unencumbered with the weight of the gear and then taking another walk with a lighter load would have allowed me to spend more time in nature. The very thing I was there to do. This was the point of the trip, right? I was so eager to go bang, 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 cross things off, get it through, get it done with, and move on to the next thing that I never appreciated what was happening in the moment. I didn't learn anything, I didn't see anything, I didn't witness anything. I remember sitting on a rocky outcropping looking out at the lake. 
I remember the sunrises and the sunsets. I remember the conversations with my dad and my uncle and my cousin. What I don't remember is walking those portages. Why? Because I was trying to get through it as quickly as possible. I didn't want to do that. But that was as much a part of the trip as everything else. I missed out on an opportunity because I was quickly dismissing it as something that I didn't want to have any part of. I was looking for shortcuts, and I missed, sorry for the expression, the forest for the trees as I walked through the portage. A few years ago, I got to go to the Holy Land, got to go to Israel, Palestine, went down to Egypt from there. It was a marvelous trip. It was a trip that our bishop had put together, and she invited uh, a number of clergy to go along on this trip. And so in preparation for going on this two-week trip, we had an orientation session. And it was one of those things where, you know, remember, remember to have your passport and shouldn't be expired and here's what you might want to pack and blah, 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 blah. The most profound piece of advice, though, that we got that night at the orientation was from another uh, colleague of mine who was a co-leader on the trip, and he said this. He said, you have a choice to make before you go out on this trip, and you should decide before you get to the airport what this choice is. He said, you can go on this trip as a pilgrim, and this can be a pilgrimage, or you can go on this trip as a tourist. He didn't even have to say any more. It's like everybody knew exactly what he meant. Are you gonna go on this trip like I was tempted to do? I'm gonna journal everything. I'm gonna see as much as possible. I'm gonna pack as much as I can into a day. I'm going to live my life through the camera lens so that I can have keepsakes when I come home. I am going to be jotting down ideas for future sermon illustrations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or was I going to go as a pilgrim? Was I gonna go in with my eyes and my ears and my heart wide open to experience whatever God was going to do in that space for me and those of us on the trip? Was I going to remember the tens of thousands, millions of people who had walked these same roads in Jesus, literally in Jesus' footsteps, remembering that and totally being present in the moment? Was I going to have an encounter with God and allow this experience to wash over me? Or was I gonna be a tourist to go use that place, get what I needed out of it, and come back home as soon as it was over? I guess I feel like that's pretty sage wisdom for our Christian lives. There are lots of people who just say, just tell me what I need to do. Do I need to get baptized? Fine, get baptized. Do I need to take communion? Fine, take communion. Join a church? Fine. Small group? Fine. Check it off my list. What do I gotta do? What do I gotta do to be in God's good graces? It's missing the point. It's not why we're here. It's not what leads to a full Christian life. It is certainly not a pilgrimage type of experience. But I do think that that is a shift in mindset that many of us need to embrace, this idea that church is not just a thing in our lives. Our religion is not just a part of what we do. Like, I like to play golf. I like to be uh, you know, a father to my kids. I like to do my job. I like to go to church on Sundays. No, it's the foundation of our lives. To see this life, to see our Christian walk as a pilgrimage is a totally different way of seeing the world. It means taking the time to do what needs to be done. It means choosing the narrower way in favor of the big highway that leads to shortcuts. It means sometimes stopping and helping others. It means having a servant's heart. It means embracing the kinds of things that Jesus talks about. It means sometimes standing in between the one being stoned and the one who are throwing the stones. It means all of that because Jesus says it's not gonna be easy, but it will lead to the kind of life that you are looking for. If we're just chasing on the next life and only focused on how do we get to that, how do I get my reward, then all we're doing is living life as a checklist when really the gift is being invited into the fullness of this life, this pilgrimage that we have the great opportunity and the privilege of being on. So sometime this week, sometime this summer, 
It won't be long, and you will have the opportunity where you will be confronted with something. And I hope it presents itself in a way of a shortcut kind of way or a narrow path kind of way. And I hope that in that moment you just take a second to pause. Filter that experience through that commandment to love one another and make your choice accordingly. Because these things will keep coming up time and time again. We won't always choose the narrow way. We're human, we're gonna take some shortcuts. We're not even gonna learn from them sometimes when they go wrong. But this is an opportunity for pilgrimage. This is an opportunity to live life as it was intended. This is the opportunity to be Jesus followers, to be disciples, to be pilgrims in this life that God has so lovingly gifted us. Thanks again for being here with us for worship. We're glad that you joined us for S3. If you'd like to know more about the church, discipleship opportunities, or ways that you can serve, be sure to click on one of the links below. Also, if you're interested in supporting the church beyond the, your prayers and your presence, we hope that you'll consider giving financially as well, and you can find that link on our page as well. Thank you for being here. Have a great week.